All right, so now that we, we've done uh, the introduction part and we learned about uh, where's everyone go and, and basically why you guys would like to do a PhD, which is awesome, right? Uh, I will kind of continue with the goal of this course, right? So we would like to make sure, and hopefully this, this answer your goal too, right? How does the computer work? It seems like a black magic box thing, right? Where you buy it from the computer store and it works, right? But these are not black magic. I mean, as similar to what you guys are doing, right? Everything we've been doing so far, we are scientists, we are engineers, we have been cooking up black magic for a while. We call this thing science and engineering and physics and maths and chemistry and biology. These are what most people would understand as black magic, but they are science and math at the end of the day, right? For this course, we would like to talk about how does the computer actually work? And we'll, we will try to understand some key techniques that we do inside the computer so that when, when you buy a new generation of Intel processor or, or AMD processor, somehow it is faster. Or like the M1 ship from Apple, then the M2 ship from Apple. Sometimes something improved, right? What are the underlying techniques? What are the underlying microarchitectural techniques that make computer work? We would like to make sure you understand the trade-off in the hardware design and be a better programmer. I would like you to think out of the box, right? This is like a, a running joke with my colleagues that, that kind of say that everyone else in computer science and computer engineering assume, right, assume that hardware is a static thing. You cannot change the hardware. And then you design everything around the current hardware that you have. But the thing is, we can change the hardware too. So I would like you now within the context of this class, right? I would like you to think out of the box as well and say, hey, if the hardware is the limitation, let's fix it. Just propose a new hardware, right? And then the next next assumption, next constraint would become like anything in material science where, they, where there's no such material yet. But I mean, now you can change the hardware. What do I expect from you? As you might have heard already, this, this class is pretty hardcore in the sense of the workload can be pretty high in, in, in some instances of the class. I'll try to tone this down for sure for this semester. Um, I would like you to, no, don't, don't this, cross this out. I don't expect you to know this. Um, pen, no, don't need that for the purpose of this semester at all. You don't need to know a lot of system background, but you need to know how logic works. Like if I say A and B, it means that A and B is true when both A and B are true. But these are typical logic that that human should understand. Well, I mean, some human does not. Sometimes just A and B, A is true, B is false, and somehow some people would argue that that's true, which is wrong, but we would like to make sure that that in this context, for the purpose of this class, you know some logic, basic logic. You are okay with C and Linux. I think this is like the, the requirement for the lab, basically. You, you need to implement things in C. If you don't know C, I have another separate YouTube link for the introduction to uh, C and Linux that I teach at Mahidol University, and I can share the video with you for sure. Let me know if that's the case. Uh, attend lectures. Uh, if you have, say, if you have to go to a conference, you have to do something important, let me know ahead of time so I can accommodate your schedule. We only have five of you guys here, so it's super easy for me to make it work for everyone. All right. So if you need to miss the lecture, let me know ahead of time so I can find a way to accommodate everyone's schedule. It's not hard. Do all the required work and work hard. I think this is like a default of any PhD student. Work hard, right? Uh, PhD push you toward the limit. One of my uh, community member and one of my uh, long time mentor uh, told me that one of the purpose of, of professors is uh, we, we, we will basically try to push you toward the cliff, a cliff so that you are right at the edge of the cliff, but not down. 
not falling down and, and, and die in the process, but like get as close. Uh, that's basically the amount of work we expect from you. We may push your limit so that you can basically become superhuman, no, but you become a, 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 a good researcher. Uh, ask questions and participate in discussion through the in class and during the class, uh, at the class website uh, or uh, when we're asking things in the class, right? Do paper review. This is important to basically know what are the previous techniques that has been proposed, right? Um, do not procrastinate. Uh, the lab cannot be done in one day. I mean, you could be possibly finish it in like a couple of days. Uh, two or three days is possible, totally possible, but you need to kind of know what you have to do, right? And do not, I do not throw a plagiarism. So if you copy something and you, you get enough. But, but if your code is inspired by some answer in Stack Overflow, let me know, put the comment in, in the code. So I am aware that you are basically re, like, look, looking at some of the answers. Not answer to the lab, but answer to, okay, I want to run it this way. How do I write a script for that? Things like that is okay, but not an entire lab, right? If I, if you do that by default, F, and I'm pretty sure everyone at Vistec will support me giving you an F, all right? Basically do your own work. Uh, grading breakdown, 20% is the lab assignment. 20% is the paper review and discussion. 40% project. 10% midterm, 10% final. And you might be questioning me and why do I do this breakdown? Why? The reason behind that is I want to emphasis on your project. I want to put the emphasis on your project. And by default, you most of you, if not all, last semester get full credit on the project. Unless you submit a project late, right? Then you get full credit for the project. That's 40 percent already. The paper review and discussion, unless you do something really, really sloppy, you also get that 20%. The lab assignments and the midterm and the final will give you enough room, give you enough room to decide how you want to weigh that. So that uh, basically, if you don't go to final but you get full credit on everything else, you still get an A, right? I, I make it such that the midterm and the final to make lower impact on your overall grade. I can test you as much as I want, but it won't kind of like impact your overall grade. I can make the lab a little bit harder, but I, I'm not going to do it. I promise, right? I promise the lab will be easier. I promise that the lab will be easier. And that's only 20% of the class, right? The rest, 60% 60, 60 of it, you got by default, by the, by the way. Basically, if you submit something that does that looks like you do the work, you're good. The review will tell your willingness to learn new ideas, right? The assignment and projects tell me you can create, you can create something from what you learn. And then the exam basically determine your knowledge of the class. Basically, this thing would kind of fully tell, right, your performance in the class. For the paper review, uh, there'll be six of them. Each one is 16%. Uh, the free three percent each. Uh, and then any additional review which you want to do is point twenty five percent per review. Uh, and why does that? Does oh the the other two percent is discussion. By the way, those two percent more than time is is full credit, right? You 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 are more than time as far as I see. You're really good at at either answering my questions or bring up a really good discussion point. Um, you can do more than 60 review if you want extra credit. It's 0.25% uh, of the total grade per review. 2% uh, class uh, participation. So please come uh, to the lecture, ask me things that you do not understand. Uh, discuss papers you read in the class. If there's review submission, uh, I'll pick a presenter uh, to kind of discuss the review at the end, the last 10 minutes. And then the rest of the class can lead, uh, basically can follow the discussion and talk about the paper. Uh, for the review, you might be wondering how do I critique a paper, right? The thing is, every single paper has a flaw. I mean, you are limited by page, the, how many pages you can put things in, right? So every single thing has a flaw. Your paper review, first of all, should have these three things. Just 
break it into different section. The summary of the paper, pros and cons, and what can you do to improve the idea further? Don't have to be long. One paragraph for the summary is fine. One paragraph for the what can you do is fine, and a few bullet points for pros and cons. The first, uh, probably the first two reviews, I'll give you a detailed feedback so that you can improve on your own review. I'll read all your review. I'll look at the effort you put in the review, and by default, is full credit unless you are doing something really sloppy. The, the, the paper reading typically gives you the background knowledge idea for the projects and improve your technical writing skill. Uh, don't plagiarize other articles, by the way. Um, I never see this from Vistech students, so I just put it there for the sake of like make sure it's there. All right. Assignments, you have a few assignments. Uh, to be honest, two assignments. <coughs> Sorry. This forces you to apply concepts we learned in class. We will build a simulator together that runs a code in MIPS assembly language. Anyone play the PlayStation 1 or 2? PS1, PS2, anyone had that? Yes. They use MIPS assembly. So whatever you simulate here actually can, well, it won't be a full emulation of the game, but it is the same language that would run those games. So in case you're curious, um, but we will only implement the limited version of that. It's a simpler version. You don't have to implement every single instruction for sure. Right. Uh, but it forces you to apply what we learned in class. You're going to give you, you, you'll be given a skeleton code. Uh, the starter code will give you some, some basic like wrapper. And you can implement the rest of the code for assignment one and assignment two. The code for assignment two is the same starter code from assignment one. So uh, it, if you have something that fail in assignment one, make sure you fix it because otherwise that, that bug will cascade into assignment two. Uh, the class project is 40% of the total grade. Uh, expectation and uh, yeah, sorry, expectation is something that is like two months worth project. Given that you are also taking other classes, it should be related to the material we learn in the class, and you need to provide your own contribution. So check with me on some ideas. Um, how to get ideas for your project? Think about what's missing from your assignments. Read paper from top tier venue in architecture like ISCA, Micro, Asplos, and HPCA. These are the absolutely base conference for Comarch papers. Uh, check out the class website. Uh, contact me, brainstorm with me, talk with people you've taken this class before, or talk with your advisor. <laughs> so the project checkpoint is in early September. I'll have the Q and A and the Q and A for the proposal as well. Basically, it's like a, a big, uh, like probably one hour slot where we can basically talk about different things you might would like to do. Uh, then mid-October, we'll have a checkpoint, and the last week of class is a presentation and a report. I allow five days of late days total, and you cannot use it on the presentation and report because that day is the absolute last day I have to make the decision on your grade. Otherwise, WISTEC will kill, like the admin at WISTEC will probably kill me. So I'll basically extend the deadline as much as possible by default. All right, you all with me? So you have five late days. You can use that on your assignments. You can use that on your review. Um, the checkpoint basically helps you prepare for the final report. The report, I'll provide a LaTeX template. Do it as best, best as you can. Think of it as the other person reading your report is a human. By the way, that guy is me. So I, I basically, if you can convey what you do to me, that's good enough. Feel free to contact me on writing resources or examples of papers that have written well. All right, so now that we're done with the admin stuff, right? So let me move on a little bit and talk quickly about what is ComArc. So what is this? Anyone seen this before? It's the roof. It's the roof. Have you been there? Have you been to Paris? Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a, the, the Louvre Museum uh, that I, I'm sure everyone know of. Uh, and this is a picture I taken back, I think it's 2014. Of, I think 14, 14, 2014. 
Uh, this is the really nice thing about our field, computer science. When we go to a conference to give talks, when we publish a paper, we get to go to different cities, right? So the conference that I was in was uh, in Paris. And so I, I basically asked my advisor uh, that, do you mind if I stay longer? Because it's in Paris, it's not the United States. So I want to travel a little bit. Easy. Nicely enough, he said, yes. So, so I stay a little bit longer. I, I take this picture uh, of the Louvre, and you can see that it's a really pretty beautiful building. So I think the surrounding building here also has the, uh, the the like the artifacts and all the the exhibit as well, right? It's a a giant complex, but the entrance is right here. That's that's where you see people queuing up, right? This is the entrance. So you can see that this is a really really beautiful building. And and I think that they make it so that it's kind of re re resemble a pyramid, right? Which is another like archive that the Egyptians built to preserve things, right? And under there, so for for uh Nong Pim, the, since you've been there, right? Uh, basically, once you go in, you can basically take the escalator down. Everything is downstairs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And anyone want to take a guess why they put things down there underground? Uh, to make it more privacy and uh, avoid thief. Oh, yeah. So that could be one of the reasons, right? To make it easier to secure, like, secure all the things they have there. Also, maybe to make it much easier to archive, right? So that it doesn't get exposed to, like, sunlight and everything easily because it's underground. Uh, so also to make this fancy, to make this whole building look like a pyramid, right? Um, so this is this is some of the things that an architect built and designed. Well, we, we don't build it. We the architect would design the thing, right? Uh, so that's one example of a really, really great piece of uh, an architecture masterpiece, right? I'll give you another another example, right? So this is a picture of the waterfall. By the way, I, I love uh, back in the day. I love taking pictures with my DSMR. Uh, these days I don't have time anymore. <laughs> so we took a trip. This is nearby CMU. It's about one and a half hour drive. Uh, is an area called Falling Water. Uh, and as you can guess from the name, it has a bunch of waterfall. This is called the Cucumber Fall. And the nice thing about that is it is 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 actually pretty small. It's small enough that I can capture the whole scene easily with my camera and I can just like set a tripod there and take a picture, right? But let's let's think about this instance when let's say someone rich come by and say, hey, I want to build a house on a waterfall. That person do exist back in the day. And they he or she or that family asked uh, a famous architect in the US called Frank Lloyd Wright to build a house on that waterfall uh this is the the this this place is called the falling water it's actually nearby cmu it's actually one of the unesco world heritage, uh, heritage site uh in there you can see there's a house right on top of it in the water uh, the, the waterfall you saw here you can go into it from the house right and if you think about it, it actually can be pretty complex to design because somehow you have to withstand all the elements, right? It it doesn't collapse after a long time. It's still there. You can go there as a museum. You can walk in, right? And every single room in there were designed with a purpose. Every single thing that you see in the building also were designed with a purpose. You go in and there's an answer to, to basically almost everything in there on why is this here? Why is that here? Why is the chimney right here? There'll be explanation for that, right? The design itself also try to encourage people to go out of the building to enjoy nature, either by going hanging out in the balcony or actually walking out, like easy access to the nature and things like that. It's like a part of the design, right? So that's the job of an architect. We take the demand, we take the idea, we formulate it and we build the design, right? So you might be wondering, so what about computer architect? We design computer, right? So 
we we fund hopefully we fundamentally understand like people who actively do do computer architect we would fundamentally understand the circuit but we don't invent new type of circuitry right we also fundamentally understand the software this is that's the user demand right our user is whoever is programming the software so we need to be a relatively okay programmer and we will we will build a machine that would match the user's demand right so well, sorry uh so that's basically the job of a computer architect we build things to match the demand from you guys actually people who do a lot of programming to actually solve awesome problem well not awesome problem but good research problem that uh, elevate where we are as a human being right so the thing is then i talk about building a good design right the next thing we have to discuss is how to evaluate the design that's performance aspect functionality can i use this hardware easily what can i do with it cost how much do i have to pay right how much do I have to pay? Usability. Usability. What can I do with it? And many other things like power efficiency. How many people own a mobile phone that never lasts an entire day? You have to charge in the middle of the day. Anyone have a phone like that? Me, actually. <laughs> yeah. And and I, I do it too. Right now I'm charging my phone, right? <laughs> Yeah, charging the phone. Uh, well, this thing, this thing actually lasts an, an entire day. But if I do play a lot of games on some random days, I need to charge in the middle of the day. That also happened to me too. That's that's another demand, right? Power efficiency. How much performance can you squeeze out given certain power budget? Right. These are always the key goals in designing good computers, and our job as an architect is to identify and achieve them. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, with a caveat, hopefully we can achieve that that goal. Right. So the role of an architect. So uh, this is adapted from uh, Yale Pat. He is a professor at UT Austin. He is my he is my advisor advisor. So I guess he's my grand grand advisor. Um. So from his lecture note, and he, he, he make a really, really good observation that, that our role is first, we need to look backward. We need to be, be able to examine old code and understand the design. We need to be an expert at looking at things that exist, right? We can analyze and we can evaluate previous proposal. We also need to look forward. We need to listen to dreamers. You guys are the dreamers for us because we need to know what are the demand of the new application. What do I need to design a good hardware for the rob uh, robotic application? What are the types of hardware that I need to, to design to be able to better interface with a bunch of the uh, uh, human body signaling that come from human? That's not an easy thing at all, right? So from the hardware design point of view, how do we build that? Look up, look up and know the nature of the problem. Under, understand the key basic software constraints, right? And look down, we know the future of the technology, know the circuit, know what are the new generation of the circuitry or the different transistor that we have, right? So that we can enable future technology. We can enable the future technology. So the other thing I would like to talk to you about is the computing stack, because in Thailand, this is a really, really big flaw of the CS and computer engineering education in Thailand. I don't know why it ended up like this, but it's really, really screwed up. Once you become the developers, you just talk, talk about front end, back end and DevOps and just implement a lot of applications, which is an awesome thing. This is required, right? This is required and this is a great job and you need to do that to implement a lot of awesome stuff, right? But the thing is behind that, behind that, that's also magic. That at this point, a lot of undergrad CS and computer engineering have no idea what's going on. And we would like to kind of talk about it too, because the computing stack is more like this. To have the problem, 
you design an algorithm to write a program so that you can build the program through the compiler. And when you run it, the runtime system come in. That part of the OS would manage the program you're running. And they would communicate with the ISA. Then it would basically invoke certain things in your CPU. Through the micro architecture, we built the CPU that's even faster and faster and faster on the logic and device. And at the end of the day, move electrons. At the end of the day, the reason why everything is plugged in, your desktop is plugged in, your laptop is plugged in, well, to the battery, your server is plugged in because we're basically moving electrons around. Right? We're moving electrons around. And the design choices would affect the software program. Everything we do in this screen box here, the system, ISA, architecture, affects you as a programmer. Anyone here owns a MacBook uh, uh, or MacBook Pro that uses the M1 or M2 chip from Apple? Anyone here? Ah, sure. Yeah. Okay. I use it. So, no, 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 use it, right? So, basically, one thing that you would realize is well, if you want to run something built for x86 and not built for ARM, now you have to do use Rosetta to run it, right? So, what do we do here? The MacBook that uses the M1 chip design the architecture with a new ISA. Well, not a new ISA, but a different ISA from x86 to ARM. And that affects you as a user because you now have to basically handling, okay, what if it's built for x86, how do I run it, right? So what if we do down here, by the way, it's also affect you guys, right? So the architecture and the system would link the gate and the wires to computer codes, right? And there's a lot of power with the abstraction of not knowing, right? You don't have to know how the computer works. You don't have to know how this function call work. You don't have to know how the print function. Anyone use everyone use print, right? In Python, there's print function. In C, there's printf. In Java, there's print as well. We all use it. How many people implemented before? Anyone? How many of you can you raise your hand if you use it without without even thinking that hey, someone actually implement this function and that library for you? That's the power of abstraction, right? We can do a lot of good things by just not having to know how this thing works, right? We assume it works, and most of the time it's a great thing. Uh, you might not want to know how how instructions are executed. You might not know how do I uh, how do I manage this in different languages. What do I run the same code but on a different machine? It performs differently. Right, and many people here, I would like personally, I would prefer to program in Python over C++, over C, over assembly, over machine code, right? Basically, also over controlling each transistor individually, right? Because that's too complicated. The question is, then why should you care? Why should you care about the detail, right? The thing is, what if your code is slow? Your code consume too much energy, or you switch your new computer, and then somehow your code is slower, right? Your program somehow produce incorrect results. You run into sick fault. You your code make computer hangs. Uh, your code shuts down a computer. I I I had an experiment that write a, a, a application for a GPU that shuts down the computer before to show that hey, the GPU is not good at doing this. Right. Uh, knowing how computer works really, really helps if these are what you run into. But you don't always have to know every single thing. That's the beauty of abstraction, right? Some obvious real world example is if you if you know about block metrics multiply, right? These are done is a is a way to do metrics multiply, but you you slice the input metrics into a much smaller matrices. This can be done to improve the cache hit rate. Your metrics on reply get a lot faster. What if I want to do a lot of metrics on reply, like machine learning? 
we can do that in parallel using a GPU, right? So ML becomes useful these days because the advance in hardware. If we don't advance, if there's no hardware advances, there's no ML. I can I can safely tell you this. If we don't move the invention in computer architecture, circuits, and the hardware design, there's no ML. There's no ML. There's no way ML exists. The reason I can say that because ML is really, really computational hungry. <laughs> so it is a good thing that your computer gets faster and faster every single generation. Another example is GPU, right? We use that in a in a real world system. I personally play all these games, right? Using a GPU. I love play games, by the way. You can also use a GPU to do a lot of awesome things, like linear algebra, visual processing, math, solving complex math algorithm, right? So these are some of the things GPU can do as well, right? And you can also maybe use it in a cloud, right? Put it in the server and you can share the GPU. To some extent, it's not full-blown sharing. Because that's actually part of my thesis is that, well, there, there can be a better way to share the GPU. Uh, but the GPU gains the popularity through the massive parallelism that they provide. This is true for both ML and all those like crypto mining that people buy the GPU for, right? Because you can run a lot of things in parallel. Um, it can be slow too, because if you heard about, let's say the new A100, it's powerful, right? But if you know the hardware, if you know the hardware, you also know that you need to write a program that's super parallel. Super parallel. Otherwise, the things like metrics multiply is really good on a CPU, uh, on a GPU. Otherwise, it's going to be super slow. You buy A100, but it's actually slower than your CPU. If you cannot parallelize your program, right? So this is one of the purpose of learning things in this class, knowing how the hardware works so you can make a decision whether you buy certain things or not. Uh, others, uh, other example is like security, right? Uh, you might have anyone heard about this uh, meltdown and Spectre? So meltdown and Spectre are uh, vulnerability, uh, vulnerability that attack the hardware itself. It attacks the CPU, right? And the thing is, well, typically if you have a, a, a like someone try to hack to your computer, what can you do to, to defend? Or try to defend? What would you do as a, as a user? Use an antivirus. Use an antivirus, yes. What else? Can you patch the software? For example, can I patch the Apple iOS and hopefully that fix a lot of bug that they have? Can I do that? Yeah. Yes, right? So these are software attacks. This thing is a hardware attack. The problem is, can I patch the hardware? Can I say, hey, I'm going to patch that CPU of yours. I would change the hardware design. Can I do that easily? Oh, I assume the long pause because you guys are thinking. The answer is no. There's no easy solution to that, right? Uh, the other possible bug, this is actually discovered uh, in, in the lab, in my advisor's lab, my colleagues, uh, my, my, my friend actually, when we were PhD students. Uh, his name is Yunggu Kim. Uh, he is right now a, a researcher at Google, but during the time when he is working on his PhD, he, he works a lot on DRAM. He's like one of the world experts on memory technology, and he was testing DRAM basically like a typical daily life of a PhD student, all the grunt work we do, right? We were uh, he was testing DRAM. 
And the way we he would test DRAM is he would basically write different data to different cell to, to basically look at different properties of the DRAM. But then he discovered that somehow when he was testing the, the DRAM cell, something, some data that you're not writing to flip. It changed from one to zero, but you're not writing to that cell, right? So it ends up being another hardware bug. Well, not, not hardware bugs, but it's hardware attack that you can do where you can actually flip the bet on the data that you do not own, some random address through certain pattern that you do, you issue to DRAM. So this is called row hammer attacks. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of follow-up papers on this topic, um, both, both the Meltdown Spectre and Roll Hammer, because these are, the hardware problem is more complicated. You can't just, you can't just go to all your users and say, hey, I, I, I want to change um, and patch your hardware. That's too costly. You cannot do it. So uh, security is another really, really uh, big thing in, in hardware design right now. What are other examples? DNA sequencing. Right, so this is actually uh, a part of the collaboration I've been uh, involved with as well, uh, with my advisor's lab as the main, uh, the main lab that's been doing this. Uh, we, like for example, over here, it's like a hardware design to perform uh, uh, DNA sequencing, uh, in particular, like basically read mapping. Uh, these are these are the the text that you want to map to the pattern that you are basically trying to figure out. And the goal here, you can think of it as a string matching problem, right? But the string matching problem can take a while to run when you have a really, really, really big input data. So we invent an uh, in-memory processor that performs that read mapping for you, right? So what else? Advanced in hardware just enable a lot of new technology, things like the tensor core, tensor processing unit come from the old idea in the 1980s called Systolic Array. The GPU also come from an old idea from the 1990s called uh, SMT and uh, uh, SIMD, right? A lot of the things you do in IO3 is basically either computer system or computer architecture. It's actually not about uh, programming. We know how to program IoT devices for Ever. Those are called embedded systems. Those are those are old knowledge. The new in, and interesting part of IoT is things like how do you improve reliability where you cannot trust those entity inside the system? How do you scale, right? How do you make the hardware power efficient? What if the hardware goes down? What if one of your sensors goes to that goes down and how do you detect and fix it? Uh, cool graphics and uh, graphic vi videos and games, right, are the advanced in hardware as well. Uh, there's actually also a lot of demand these days for people who know computer architecture and system, both of them, right? If you, you know them well, right? A lot of programmer has close to zero knowledge on how the computer actually works, so you can optimize your code better. Uh, you can also further optimize the popular workload beyond what 99% of people can do, right? And what else? You uh, maybe you want to stop our community, like the Thai CS community, from launching crap like things that could crash when a lot of people are using it, or the network where the SMS goes down quite a lot and you cannot get the OTP, um, or the app that goes down, right? Uh, another app that goes down that impacts people's life. Right. Once you know the hardware enough, once you know the system enough, you can actually reduce people's suffering because now you don't make poor design decision anymore. Or at least you, you hopefully you make a better design decision. All right. And I don't blame a lot of these engineers because may, maybe they don't have the budget to do it. That's a possible reason because, well, it's a, it's a big problem in Thailand. We don't have enough budget to do these things. Right. But knowing the hardware, knowing the system can help. That's my key message here, right? And now that we are about halfway through, I would like to end with the intermission about uh, today's homework. And I said, as I said, we 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 have the uh, submission on Thursday, next Thursday. Uh, it's a it's a talk called the Miracle Machine, right? And I would like you guys to watch it. That's an assignment 
already called homework in the in, on canvas is about 30 minutes long It's a really 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 good talk um if you want to figure out how to deliver a good presentation look at this look at this talk this is one a really really good talk right uh another really good example is ajan egg uh ted talk the the one that talks about the deep fake technology as well that's also a really really good and well delivered talk all right so that's your homework today i want to kind of pause right here yeah so i want to pause right here uh first let me stop the recording